Congressman Steve Horn chaired this hour and 40 minute hearing. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and Intergovernmental Relations will come to order. Federal agencies rely on computer systems to support critical operations that are essential to the health and well-being of millions of Americans. National defense, emergency services, tax collection, and benefit payments will all rely on automated systems and electronically stored information. This technology has greatly streamlined government operations, yet without proper security measures, federal computers are highly vulnerable to cyber attacks. These attacks are dramatically increasing in volume and sophistication. Last year, the number of cyber attacks rose 71 percent above the previous year. In addition, they are more complex, affecting government and non-government computers alike. Earlier this year, a British computer administrator penetrated 100 U.S. military computers, shutting down networks and corrupting data at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and at the Pentagon. Equally disturbing, the hacker successfully attacked these sensitive systems by using software that was readily available on the Internet. Threats such as this demand that the federal government move quickly to protect its critical computer systems. This is the subcommittee's third annual report card and we're now spending it out, and uh, we'll go into questions on it later. This subcommittee uh, will be uh, uh, this with the third annual report card, and uh, we have grading executive branch agencies on their computer security efforts. I am disheartened to uh, announce that again this year the government has earned an overall grade of F for its computer security efforts. Despite the administration's welcomed focus on this important problem, 14 agencies scored so poorly that they earned individual grades of an F. The Department of Transportation lake lags at the bottom of the scorecard, earning an appalling 28 points out of a possible 100 on the subcommittee's grading systems. At the top end of the report card, I'm pleased to note that the Social Security Administration continues to be a shining example of sound leadership and focused attention towards solving this important problem. Earning a score of 82, the Social Security Administration's grade votes from a C plus to a B minus. This agency was the first to become Y2K compliant in 1999, and I have no doubt that it will also be the leader in the government's effort to protect its critical computer systems. Hopefully, the Department of Transportation and all other failing agencies will benefit from the experience and expertise of today's witnesses. September 11, 2001, taught us that we must be prepared for attack. We cannot allow government operations to be compromised or crippled because we failed to heed that lesson. Uh, I asked uh, the Vice Chairman, Mr. Lewis of Kentucky, uh, if you'd like to have an opening statement. Why? Uh, then Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I just want to say one thing. Um, at the end of this term, um, the American taxpayer will be losing a man that has been uh, uh, in the uh, front lines of looking out after their interest and uh, putting pressure on the government to, uh, to be efficient 
and to use the taxpayer dollar wisely. And uh, Mr. Chairman, it uh, certainly will uh, again be a, a sad day for the American taxpayer and, uh, and it'll be a sad day for all of us to, uh, to see you uh, retire. But thank well, you for your great service. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ron. That's nice of you. You've been a good partner. I'm now going to bring in the witnesses and their assistants and we'll have them take the oath. This is an investigative committee and uh, that's the way we operate. If you'll stand, raise the right hand. Have your assistants behind you, the clerk will note all of the names there and put in the hearing record. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Clerk will note, take the names, and thank you. And we will now start with the presentation. And the presentation is simply down the agenda line. And we start with uh, Mark A. Foreman, Associate Director, Information Technology and E-Government, Office of the President's Management and Budget. Uh, Mr. Foreman, we're glad to see you again. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Lewis. Before I begin, I, I would also like to acknowledge the significant role that you've played in the last decade on IT issues. Uh, through your leadership, we've all witnessed a substantial increase in attention and efforts to improve the federal government's management of information technology. You've captured the attention of senior policy officials across agencies, challenged administrations, and as a result, have helped focus uh, on an understanding of the serious issues, uh, particularly IT security, financial management, and the year 2000 conversion. I thank you for your work in these areas. I also want to acknowledge the work of my lead security analyst, Glenn Schlarman, who will be leaving OMB to work at a department at the end of the year. Glenn has led OMB's work in cybersecurity and related information policy since the mid-1990s and deserves much credit for the progress made in this area by federal agencies. Mr. Chairman, we all know that our federal government's IT security problems are serious and pervasive. However, I'm pleased to report today that while problems persist, several agencies are demonstrating progress, due in large part to your leadership. Since the last hearing in March, a number of achievements have been made toward improving the federal government's IT security. First, the combination of the Security Act reporting requirements, OMB's reporting instructions, and agency plans of actions and milestones have resulted in a substantial improvement in the accuracy and depth of information provided to Congress relating to IT security. In addition to IG evaluations, agencies are now providing the Congress, Congress with data from agency POAMs, the plans of action, and agency performance against uniform measures. Second, OMB developed and issued objective IT security management performance measures, which were the basis for the most recent agency reports and plans of action. Third, we developed a government-wide assessment tool based primarily on the National Institute of Standards and Technology's technical guidance and the GAO's Federal Information Systems Control Audit Manual. Fourth, to ensure successful remediation of security weaknesses throughout an agency, every agency must now maintain a central process through the CIO's office to monitor agency compliance. Fifth, we developed additional guidance on reporting IT security cost. Six, several agencies have demonstrated mature IT security management practices. Seven, government-wide online IT security training and courseware is being made available and used. And eight, deployment of cross-agency e-authentication capabilities is occurring. As we move into the second year of actual reforms built around the Government Information Security Reform Act, uh, and based primarily on agency and IG reports submitted in September. Integration of security into agency's budget processes and recently updated and submitted IT security plans of actions and milestone. OMB has conducted an initial assessment of the federal government's IT security status. Due to the baseline of agency IT security performance identified last year, we're now in a position to more accurately determine where progress has been made and where problems remain. Having objective performance measures has improved the quality process, and I'd like to say there are five good news items we found in our review. First, more departments are exercising greater oversight of their bureaus. 
Second, many agency program officials, CIOs, and IGs are engaged and working together. Third, the inspectors general have greatly expanded their work beyond financial systems and related programs, and their efforts have proved invaluable to us in the process. Four, more agencies are using their plan of actions and milestones as authoritative management tools to ensure program and system level IT security weaknesses, once identified, are being tracked and corrected. And fifth, OMB's conditional approval or disapproval of agency IT security programs has resulted in senior executives at most agencies paying greater attention to IT security. The bad news is that as we predicted in our previous testimony, the more IT systems that agencies and IGs review, the more security weaknesses we're finding. Our initial analysis reveals that while progress has been made, there remain several significant weaknesses. First, many agencies find themselves faced with the same security weaknesses year after year, the lack system level security plans and certification. Through the budget process, OMB is assisting agencies in prioritizing and reallocating funds to address these problems. Second, some IGs and CIOs have vastly different views of the state of agency security programs. Although some agencies have already acted to address more rigorous findings, OMB will highlight such discrepancies in our feedback to agency heads. Third, many agencies are not adequately prioritizing their IT investments and therefore are seeking funding to develop new systems while significant security weaknesses exist in their legacy systems. OMB will assist agencies in reprioritizing their resources through the budget process. I'd like to talk a little bit about the six common weaknesses we identified in the IT security report to Congress last year. Uh, first, lack of agency senior management attention to security. In addition to conditionally approving or disapproving agency IT security programs through private communication between OMB and the agency head, We've used the President's Management Agenda Scorecard to continue to focus attention on serious IT security weaknesses. Through the scorecard, OMB and senior agency officials are monitoring agency progress on a quarterly basis. Second, non-existent IT security performance measures. Performance measures I referenced earlier also address the performance of officials charged with implementing specific requirements of the Security Act. These measures are mandatory and represent the minimum metrics against which agencies must track and measure performance and progress. Third, pure, poor security education awareness. As in my testimony, the administration's electronic government initiative called e-training will incorporate additional security courses and, of course, agencies are using traditional classroom-style training. While OMB can and will continue to assist agencies with their efforts in addressing their security weaknesses, both the responsibility and the ability to fix these weaknesses ultimately lie with the agencies. I'd like also to address some additional areas for attention. OMB, the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board at the federal agencies and others are addressing a number of other significant IT security issues. The administration strives to ensure that disruption of federal IT systems are infrequent, of minimal disruption, manageable, and cause the least damage possible. In this regard, we are essentially addressing two types of threats, organized and ad hoc. We'll ensure that federal agencies undertake effective systems management practices with tools and training to ensure timely deployment and continued maintenance of security of IT systems. But countering sophisticated organized threats is far more complex. The development of a government-wide enterprise architecture is a central part of the administration's IT management and electronic government efforts. Accordingly, the administration will use this to better prioritize and fund the federal government's security needs. I run through uh, a number of other additional comments in my testimony, but let me conclude uh, by saying, Mr. Chairman, Again, I'd like to express the administration's appreciation for your entire leadership IT, on IT security and government IT management in general. Thank you. And we will uh, now move to the next witness, and then when we finish the witnesses, we will begin the questioning. Uh, we are delighted to have the Honorable James B. Lockhart III, the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer of Social Security, Social Security Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Lewis. 
Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss computer security at Social Security Administration. Commissioner Barnhart and I believe that it is indeed a critical 24 by 7 issue. We recognize that creating an effective security program is not just a technical issue, but also an issue that, that demands the attention of top management. Today I would like to outline the challenges we face and significant strides our agency has made to further safeguard information security. Our approach to computer security is forward-looking while focusing on continuous monitoring and continuous improvement. The systems challenges we face are substantial. In a typical workday, we interact with about 500,000 people through our field offices, telephone network, and internet services. To handle our workloads, we rely on seven mainframe processors based in our National Computer Center and on more than 100,000 network connected workstations in over 1,500 locations throughout the country. These computers process more than 35 million transactions a day. Our chief security officer sets agency policy for information security. That position was recently elevated to report directly to the chief information officer, who reports directly to the commissioner and myself. The CIO reports to the commissioner annually on the state of security in SSA, but in reality, it's really a regular agenda item at all our executive staff meetings and also at the Executive Internal Control Committee, which I chair. We have made President Bush's management agenda, including e-government and a specific security measure, part of our new senior executive service performance system. We have also incorporated a performance measure in our annual performance plan. System security has been integrated into our systems development lifecycle for more than 15 years. However, in the last year, we've begun a number of improvements to ensure that the security program remains responsive to evolving technologies and vulnerabilities. System intrusions are one major area of concern. Social Security uses a variety of pro pro proactive measures plus individual testing, in independent testing, and evaluation of security controls to detect and prevent attempted intrusions. For example, we use state-of-the-art art software that registers, restricts, and records user access to data. It also determines what function a person can do once they have access to the, to the data. Passwords are changed every 30 days. The software allows Social Security to audit usage and provides a means to investigate uh, allegations of misuse. At least once a month, we also scan every workstation, telephone, and system platform for compliance. Social Security's commitment to information security is really shared throughout the whole organization. It is really part of the Social Security culture that is, really, that is reinforced through training and frequent communications. Frontline employees know to contact the agency-wide help desk when a virus or intrusion is suspected. The help desk quickly contacts the first response group comprised of both senior management and technical staff who can rapidly mobilize appropriate resources. Social Security has a strong, critical infrastructure protection process to assure agency business processes function despite catastrophes. The program includes project matrix reviews, audits, risk assessments, remediation plans, and related training. Congress has greatly helped to raise awareness of information security. The Government Information Security Reform Act of 2000 further the agenda of system security by providing for an assessment and reporting mechanism. We completed our annual security self-assessment in September of this year. We actually hired an independent technology consulting firm to look at our self-assessment, and they concurred with our self-rating, and we're impressed with our security program. So Security's Inspector General's review stated that we met the GISRA requirements and made improvements since last year. However, as we all know, there's always room for further improvements. In conclusion, Commissioner Barnhart and all of us at Social Security recognize that system security is not a one-time task, but an ongoing mission. We know we must be vigilant to ensure that personal records remain secure, taxpayer dollars are protected, and public confidence in Social Security is maintained. I would also like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your work over the years in improving awareness of the importance of not only system security, but also a wide range of program stewardship issues such as financial accounting and reporting, debt collection, and Y2K. 
I can assure you that we will continue to work with this subcommittee to help protect the information security of the American people for which we are stewards. I will be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. And uh, I will hope that there will be excellent people in this, both for minority and majority. So thank you. Keep the heat on this subcommittee and vice versa. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And we now have a uh, longtime friend of this committee, the Honorable Kenneth M. Mead, Inspector General, Department of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewis, I, like my uh, colleagues and Mr. Lewis, would like to start by just saying thank you um, for so many things over the years. I, uh, this hearing is, I suppose the words almost certainly uh, would apply here, the, the one of the last hearings that you'll be uh, conducting in this capacity. And you've truly been a champion of good government. Um, I think most recently, the, certainly the successful transition to Y2K uh, was a triumph of the oversight practices of this committee and your stewardship. But it's the full range of management issues, and the inspector general community uh, will miss you. I mentioned Y2K. Actually, computer security has a lot of similarities with the Y2K experience. Uh, if you stop and think about it, Y2K involved a process where you, first of all, had to inventory your systems, you had to identify the vulnerabilities, then you had to do a cost-effective uh, cost risk analysis of, analysis of what holes needed to be plugged, and you had to set priorities. Um, a big difference, of course, is that in Y2K, we had a date certain to meet. Uh, no waivers from anybody. Uh, it was bound to happen, and that's what those were the marching orders. Uh, here, uh, the date is a, a little less fuzzy, but I think we need to move forward with the same sense of vigor because of the importance of the area. I'd like to briefly summarize where DOT has been, progress that's been made, and what it needs to do to secure its critical systems. And the bulk of my testimony is based on the report we recently issued under GISRA uh, OMB has it, uh, you have it, the Secretary has it, and we're pleased with the Department's response. DOT's information security program uh, remains a material weakness as reported last year, and we're going to recommend that it be reported as such again this year. Um, I must say that under Secretary Mineta's leadership, DOT has made a strong commitment for improvement, and there is noticeable progress that um, I can specify but they have a long way to go. A notable example of progress has been that DOT significantly enhanced defense against intrusions from the Internet. FAA upgraded and increased background checks on its employees. But there are six areas that DOT needs to focus on, and here's what they are. First and foremost, as in most things, established leadership. DOT does not have a CIO. Chief Information Officer. And in fact, in the six years since the Clear Cohen Act was passed, uh, we've had a CIO for 18 months of that period. And we don't have one now. Um, I should say that it's not for want of active recruiting, but we need one. And, Mr. Chairman, it's not only a case of just having a CIO with someone with that title. The <laughs> DOT CIO office, in our judgment, does not have um, sufficient authority or controls over the operating of divisions, uh, information technology budgets, or performance. You know, DOT is set up, we have about uh, nine or ten agencies, FAA, Coast Guard, Federal Highway Administration, so forth and so on. But the operating divisions generally have not in the past been held accountable to answer to the CIO. And this will be evidenced in several of the other points I'm, I'm going to illustrate here. A second area is securing computer systems against unauthorized intrusions. Several years ago, when we reported to this committee, DOT did not have firewall security. Intruders could easily uh, gain access to DOT systems, computers, from the Internet. Two years ago, we testified that the firewall security was not strong enough and there were unsecured so-called back doors to access DOT computers. Since then, DOT has enhanced its firewall security against unauthorized intrusion from the Internet. 
which are referred to as the front door. But despite repeated directives from the agency's CIO office, there are still a significant number of unsecured so-called backdoors. What are backdoors? Backdoors are dial-up modems. Um, they are non-DOT computers that are connected to those of DOTs, in many cases by the hundreds of contractors that DOT has. Uh, we think that's a significant risk area. Third, reporting cyber incidents. incidents. DOT needs to do a better job in analyzing and reporting major cyber incidents. Last year they reported 25,000 incidents, but most of those were not analyzed or stratified for degree of seriousness. And most of them, my guess is, is um, were innocent acts of somebody uh, misusing a password or whatever. We also found, though, that th of three of ten major incidents we had went unreported to the Federal Computer Incident Response Center. We think that needs to be strengthened. Fourth, protect e-government services. DOT needs to better protect its public websites from being attacked. We, in our audit work, identified 450 odd vulnerabilities throughout DOT. 60% of them were at FAA, and Federal, and Federal Highway Administration had um, about 113 of them. Of the 450-odd vulnerabilities, Mr. Chairman, we would rank about 80 of them as being very serious, meaning that they could allow attacker, attackers to take control over DOT websites. DOT, I should note, promptly corrected the vulnerabilities we identified. Fifth area, check contractors' employees' background. DOT still needs to do more in this area. I'm happy to report that FAA has made progress. I believe it was in a hearing uh, before this in a couple other congressional committees where this is a major problem three years ago. Um, our tests now indicate that about 84% of FAA contractor employees have received background checks versus just 23% two years ago. But still, the delta between that 84% and 100% is too significant in my view. Unfortunately, other DOT agencies have not made as much progress and their compliance rate rose only from 13% to 14%. And finally, a major task is get all DOT's 561 mission critical systems certified for adequate security. The current date for doing that is set at December 2005. This challenge is particularly similar to Y2K. Y2K. Right now, we have completed the security assessment, not we, the, the, the DOT, of 123 of 561 of those systems. Uh, they have a long way to go. And I'm a little concerned about the date of two, December 2005 being uh, several years away, and I'd like to see this process accelerated, but it's going to require top management commitment and putting the pressure on. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to close to say a word about the role for in inspector generals and GAO. And I think this is alluded to in Mr. Foreman's uh, written statement. I'm concerned that too much reliance is being placed on the inspector generals and GAO to identify vulnerabilities. So I noted, we identified 450 odd of them. Those were plugged when we identified them. But you don't want to rely on your inspector generals and GAO to identify all the vulnerabilities. Inspector generals are fairly small operations. We're supposed to audit. We are not in the business of running the uh, security program. I'm pleased to report that I think under Secretary Mineta's leadership, this is beginning to change at DOT. But it needs to change in a much larger way. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we appreciate uh, the uh, thoughts you have there, and we'll get to that a little later. We now have Richard D. Pythia, and he is the director of the CERT Coordination Center of Carnegie Mellon, and you've been very helpful to this subcommittee over the last uh, decade and a half. And you might want to put on the record the 
what does CERT mean? And uh, be glad to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on computer security issues. And Mr. Chairman, thank you especially for helping us all focus on this important IT-related topic. Uh, my perspective comes from the work that we do at the CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team, uh, where since 1988 we have handled over 170,000 separate computer security incidents and cataloged more than 8,000 computer vulnerabilities. <coughs> um, during that time, the Internet has changed dramatically, and computers have become such an integral part of American government and business that computer-related risks cannot be separated from national defense general safety, health, business, and privacy risks. Valuable government and business assets, citizen and personnel information, critical services are now at risk over the Internet. Our increasing dependency on these network systems is being matched by an increase in the number of attacks aimed at those systems. The CERT Coordination Center alone, one of only uh, over 200 uh, incident response team globally, has seen a dramatic increase in the number of incidents reported over just the last four years, from 3,700 in 1998 to over 52,000 in 2001, and at the current reporting rates, 2002 will top 100,000 separate incidents. These attacks are aimed at systems across government and industry and have led to loss and compromise of sensitive data, loss of productivity, system damage, financial loss, and loss of reputation and customer confidence. Virus and worm attacks alone have resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars of loss in just the last 12 months. Uh, most threatening of all is the link between cyberspace and physical space. Supervisory control and data acquisition systems are used to control power grids, water treatment and distribution systems, oil and chemical refineries, and other physical systems. Increasingly, these control systems are being connected to communications links and networks to reduce operational costs by supporting remote maintenance and remote control functions. These systems are potential targets of individuals bent on causing massive disruption and physical damage. This is not theory. Actual attacks have caused major operational problems in Australia, for example, where attacks against sewage plants have led to the release of hundreds of thousands of gallons of sewage sludge. <clears throat> the Internet has become a virtual breeding ground for attackers. Intruders share information about vulnerable sites, vulnerabilities in the technology, and attack tools. Internet attacks are difficult to trace. The protocols make it easy for attackers to hide their identity and location on the network. The number of cyber attackers that have been identified and prosecuted is minuscule compared to the number of security incidents that are reported on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> Our systems are vulnerable. Last year, we received 2,400 vulnerability reports, reports of weaknesses in pieces of software, and we expect to receive over 4,300 reports by the end of this year. These vulnerabilities are caused by security weak design and development practices. With this number of vulnerabilities, fixing vulnerable systems is being difficult. System and network administrators are in a hard spot. It is often months or years before patches are implemented on the vulnerable computers, and we often receive reports even years after the fact of, of uh, attacks of uh, vulnerabilities that have been, in fact, known for, for two or three years. And at the same time, the attack technology is advancing. Today, intruders use worm technology and other automated methods to reach tens of thousands of computers in minutes where it once took weeks or months. Working our way out of this vulnerable position will require a multi-pronged approach. First, higher quality products. Good software engineering practices can dramatically improve our ability to withstand attacks. The solution is going to require a combination of virus-proof software, reducing implementation errors by at least two orders of magnitude over today's levels, and requiring that vendors ship products with high security default configurations. We encourage the government to use its buying power to demand such higher quality software. Acquisition processes must place more emphasis on security characteristics, and we suggest using code integrity clauses that hold vendors more accountable for defects in their released products. Acquisition professionals should be trained in current government security regulations and policies, but also in the fundamentals of security concepts and architectures. It's important that these people understand not only how to work within the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law to get the quality of software that we require in our national systems. 
Also needed is wider adoption of security practices. Senior management attention here is important. Senior management must increase its involvement with visible endorsement of security improvement efforts and the provision of the resources needed to implement the required improvements. For the long term, research is also essential to seek fundamental technological solutions and preventative approaches. Needed in the long term is a unified and integrated framework for all information assurance analysis, rigorous methods to quantifiably assess and manage risks, quantitative techniques to determine the cost benefit of risk mitigation strategies, and simulation tools to analyze the cascade effects of attacks, accidents, and failures across interdependent systems. The nation as a whole requires more qualified technical specialists. Government scholarship programs uh, that have started are a good step in the right direction, but they need to be expanded over the next five years to build the university infrastructure we need for the long-term development of trained security professionals. Also needed is more awareness and training for all internet security users with special emphasis paid uh, to students in grade schools to can begin to understand the ethics of use of these wide area networks as they understand ethics and other kinds of situations. In conclusion, security incidents are almost doubling each year and attack technology will continue to evolve to create attacks that are even more virulent and damaging. Solutions are not simple, but must be pursued aggressively to allow us to keep our information infrastructures operating at acceptable levels of risk. We can make significant progress by making changes in software design and development practices, giving more management support to risk management activities, increasing the number of trained system managers and administrators, improving the level of knowledge of all users, and increasing research into secure and survivable systems. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to still know what uh, CERT is. And I've looked through here. You've got all sorts of things that you could uh, put in there. But, uh, you know, is it the uh, Center on Readiness and uh, Training and so forth? Computer Emergency Response Team. Okay. Good enough. Yeah, you've got a busy type. And uh, we thank you for all the things you've done for us and the various people in this town. So thank you for uh, having that uh, very fine uh, university and that very fine uh, CERT coordination center. We now go to the last presenter, Robert F. Dacey, Director, Information Security, the United States General Accounting Office, and headed by the Controller General of the United States. And uh, you and your staff have done a marvelous position every year helping us look at uh, this material when they come in to the Office of Management and Budget. So, uh, Director Dacey. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Lewis. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. And before providing my testimony, however, I would like to thank you personally, Mr. Chairman, for your sustained and dedicated efforts to improving federal information technology management, especially in the areas of Y2K and information security. And from my prior experience, your extreme interest in improving financial management throughout the federal government. Your tireless vigilance has resulted in increased attention to these important areas and have stimulated many positive results. As you requested, I will briefly summarize my written statement. Federal agencies rely extensively on computerized systems and electronic data to support their missions. If these systems are inadequately protected, resources such as federal payments and collections could be lost or stolen. Computer resources could be used for unauthorized purposes or to launch attacks on others. Sensitive information such as taxpayer data and proprietary business information could be inappropriately disclosed or browsed or copied for purposes of espionage or other types of crime. Critical operations, such as those supporting national defense and emergency services, could be disrupted. Data could be modified or destroyed for purposes of fraud, deception, or disruption. And agency missions could be undermined by embarrassing incidents that result in diminished confidence in their ability to conduct operations and to fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities. As Mr. Pethia pointed out, the risks are dramatically increasing over the years and have been. There are a lot of reasons for this, which he discussed, 
And I would like to again highlight, first of all, is greater complexity and interconnectivity of systems, including within federal systems and between federal systems and other systems. In many cases, trusted relationships exist between these systems which allow open access if someone breaks in to one of the systems. Secondly, standardization of systems, hardware, and software, which combined with known vulnerabilities create significant exposures. Third, the increased volume, sophistication, and effectiveness of cyber attacks, which combines with readily available intrusion or hacking tools and limited capabilities to detect such attacks. And fourth, the development of cyber attack capabilities by other nations, terrorist criminals, and intelligence services. In addition to the threat of external attacks, the disgruntled insider is also a significant threat because such individuals often have knowledge that allow them to gain unrestricted access and inflict damage or steal assets. While both the threat and ease of cyber attack are increasing, our most recent analysis of reports issued since October 2001 continue to show significant pervasive weaknesses in federal unclassified computer systems that put critical federal operations and assets at risk. We have reported on the potentially devastating consequences of poor information security since September of 1996 and have identified information security as a high risk area since 1997. Our chart, which is on the right here, illustrates the significant weaknesses that were reported for each of the 24 agencies included in our review, which covers the six major areas of general controls, that is, those areas that cover either all or a major portion of an agency's information systems and help to ensure their proper operation. As the chart shows, most agencies had significant weaknesses in many or all of the control areas, and efforts to expand and improve information security uh, may result in additional significant deficiencies being identified. Also, all agencies had weaknesses in security program management, which can often lead to weaknesses in other control categories. At the same time, a number of actions to improve information security are underway, both at an agency and government-wide level. Some of these actions may require time to fully implement and address all of the significant weaknesses that have been identified. Implementation of government information security reform, commonly known as GISRA, is proving to be a significant step in improving federal agency information security. We are pleased to note that Congress has recently passed legislation to continue and improve these efforts. In its fiscal 2001 report to Congress on GISRA, OMB acknowledged the information security challenges faced by the federal government and highlighted six common security weaknesses which Mr. Foreman earlier discussed. Highlighting weaknesses through GISRA reviews, evaluations, and reporting helps agencies to undertake corrective actions. Also, many agencies reported that first-year implementation has resulted in increased management attention and created a baseline for future reviews. In addition, GISRA implementation has resulted in important actions by the administration, which if properly implemented should continue to improve information security in the federal government. Mr. Foreman previously highlighted these actions in his testimony and some of the new actions they are taking. In addition, the President has taken broader actions in the areas of homeland security and critical infrastructure protection that also can lead to improvements in federal information security. In addition to these actions, GAO believes that there are a number of important steps the administration and agencies should take to ensure that information security receives appropriate attention and resources and that known deficiencies are addressed. These steps include delineating the roles and responsibilities of the numerous entities involved in federal information security and CIP, or critical infrastructure protection, providing more specific guidance on controls agencies need to implement, obtaining adequate technical expertise to select implement and maintain controls, allocating sufficient resources for information security, and continuing research and development efforts to find new ways to manage information security better. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lewis, this concludes my statement. I'll be pleased to answer any questions that you have at this time. The Vice Chairman, Mr. Lewis, uh, would like to uh, take a look at uh, some of these. and. Uh, uh, I want him here because he's the only member of this full committee and the subcommittee of Ways and Means. That's a very uh, lofty committee and goes back to uh, the first uh, 1789. And uh, 
they also have to do with tax administration. And uh, I'm hoping with him being on Mays and Ways and Means that we can get our debt collection law, which Mrs. Maloney and I put together in 1996, and it's going great right now. It's just that's for non-tax, and uh, now we'd love to have you, Ron, as the, uh, if you can sneak in of night to uh, get them to uh, get the de uh, debt collection in. Uh, and uh, when I looked at that, and that's when I asked the then president, how about getting a CEO? Uh, because uh, we're not getting anywhere in uh, IRAS. And one pot had $100 billion sitting there to be collected. When I counseled that one, they said, oh, oh, there's one other one, easier, $60 billion. And we're looking for money in this country. Uh, let's get it done. And you will be a hero, Ron. And uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we, uh, we could use some extra money right now, couldn't we? Yep. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Foreman, uh, the OMB has issued guidelines uh, stating that agencies must include uh, security procedures in their budget requests for imp information technology projects. If they do not, the OMB has said it will not fund the project. Has the OMB refused any funding for this reason? Yes, we did uh, last year. There will, of course, be some more um, feedback we'll give to the agencies. Uh, generally, the approach, and we do this with a, a business case, is to uh, refuse funding if an agency does not have um, uh, good justification on a number of the component security being one of them. There are a number of um, programs last year that we put on the high risk list for fiscal year 03 where security was the predominant problem. And so we spent quite a few months working with the agencies to address the security problems. I'd say generally, I, I can't say for a fact it's in every case, but generally uh, the agencies would rather work through their security problems than not get funding. So sure. that incentive structure seems to work. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. I get I get the opportunity to to uh, give you some more questions here. <laughs> uh, the Security Act requires that agency uh, corrective action plans address all known vulnerabilities. If agency plans fail to include all known vulnerabilities, what action will the OMB take? We. Uh through, through la both last year's guidance and then this, this year's most recent guidance have taken a comprehensive approach. Um, it's one of the reasons that, that we uh, believe so strongly in having both the CIO's report and an audit follow-up process leveraging the IGs. Uh, the ultimate uh, approach, therefore, when we get the reports and the submission is to compare the two sets of data, also use the GAO uh, data and work via the budget process to ensure uh, that remediation occurs. I'd say, as I pointed out in my testimony, one of the recurring problems that we've seen is uh, agencies' desires to invest in new IT and at the same time claim that they can't remediate legacy systems problems. Uh, there's a trade-off to be made. Obviously, if a legacy system is only going to exist for five or six months, uh, one may not invest in a total security overhaul, and there are other ways to protect the system. Um, but there are too many instances still where we see uh, agencies not doing what I consider the nuts and bolts here, the corrective action plan, has to include uh, some certification and accreditation of the legacy systems. And so, uh, again, we are making very clear to the agencies uh, that we're simply not going to fund new investments and short remediation on the accreditation certification. I think you'll see that that's a much bigger focus this year for us when the report comes in, in the February time frame. Uh, based on the uh, OMB's analysis uh, to the performance measures required in the Government uh, Information Security Reform Act reports, accurately measures the agency's progress in, uh, in securing their critical and computer systems. Does it? The, 
the uh, I, I think there are uh, a couple um, issues to consider. First of all, I, I'd say yes, but it's at a high management level. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, the chairman has worked so hard on for many years, I think is coming to fruition. We've got secretaries and deputy secretaries now who are focusing on security. In fact, within the White House all the way up to the president, people are focused on cybersecurity now. Um, there's a difference, though, as we get uh, into the details, and I, I think as um, my colleague from GAO has laid out very clearly, it's time to get into the nuts and bolts. And program management now comes much more to the forefront. So we, too, are going to shift our, our focus on that and onto a lot of nuts and bolts issues. At the same time, I don't think you can ignore the fact that the vulnerability and threat picture has shifted. So there are a couple of uh, types of threats. Uh, one, I would consider the hacker threat that we addressed in, in the testimony. And in, in there, we're making much heavier reliance on uh, FedCERC and increasing their capabilities, uh, the patch management uh, co services contract that I alluded to, and by leveraging XML and, and some of the easier reporting technologies to reduce the burden and literally allow for electronic type reporting now of inc incidents. So you don't have to have a person in the process per se. Uh, we can make that a seamless process and we'll move forward in that. The organized threats are, are going to take a different uh, level of response and a different uh, approach to that, uh, I think, than what we're doing in hackers. Um, the, while I can't get into, obviously, much of um, the discussions going on, I think um, you're probably aware that the, the deadline for comments on the cyber strategy is, is today. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, regardless of what happens, we know we have to tighten up uh, the continuity of business operation planning, again, as Mr. Dacey alluded to. Uh, it's better, but this is very similar to the Y2K issue. And before September 11th last year, I'd say uh, very few of the agencies had been maintaining their continuity of, option, of operations plans. So that, too, has become a big focus for us. Okay, one more question. Uh, the OMB's 2001 report to Congress required by the Government Information Security Reform Act highlighted six common weaknesses at federal agencies. Have you noted any significant improvements uh, in uh, these areas? Uh, as I alluded to in, to, in my testimony, testimony um, yes, although it's not as government-wide as we would like to see in all the areas. Some agencies are making uh, marked progress. Uh, we have some discrepancies based on our initial view uh, versus the chairman's uh, scorecard. Um, but what I'd say is that the most marked increase is in the senior manager, the secretary and Dep deputy secretary focus. And uh, that, without a doubt, is uh, uniform now across the board, as I think you heard from uh, Deputy Secretary Lock Lockhart and uh, also others uh, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's talk uh, about uh, Commissioner Lockhart's uh, work and uh, how that uh, goes about. And uh, would it be possible, Mr. Foreman, that OMB might have various types of teams brought together of different uh, cabinet departments so that you could go out uh, the word accreditation was mentioned a little while ago. And uh, if we had a team like that that needed some uh, uh, help, uh, would that be useful to OMB? Well, there are some uh, teams in the federal government that do get involved in a range of um, security reviews, obviously at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, Department of Energy, and I believe some other departments. Um, th there's a fruitful uh, source of this support in the private sector. Um, the Interior Department, for example, has engaged uh, a company to help them with accreditation and certification. Um, this uh, capability is a type of service that, um, exactly as you laid out, is project-based, it's team-based. 
uh, and I don't know that it's inherently governmental. Um, there are clearly a set of government rules and regulations, but there are also industry practices. Uh, it gets down to things like uh, what's the proper way to install a certain type of software or a certain server? Uh, is it outside or inside the firewall? And my preference would actually be that rather than build up huge teams within the government that were forever trying to work across traditional silos, that we would uh, increase our reliance or continue our reliance on the private sector teams. I know that the companies, uh, as us, have a growing demand for that type of service. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lockhart, uh, would you uh, be willing to let some of your best people for a while go uh, in other parts of the executive branch? Well, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we do have some very good people uh, and uh, we have some very big challenges now. We, we very much like to work with the rest of the government and we're, we're trying to through mechanisms like the President's Management Council, which I serve on, trying to go across government and, and work together. Uh, I guess I would agree with Mr. Foreman uh, that, uh, and we use this extensively, we use a lot of private sector expert technology cons consulting firms to do this kind of activities. We, we work with them, we'd be happy to share our expertise, uh, but we have a lot of needs even though we have good grades from you. We still have a lot of way, long ways to go, so I, I'd like to keep them internally if we could. <laughs> well, I can realize that, but uh, it seems to me when you don't have to do it all the years, but get in there and help them. And, well, uh, well, certainly we're, we're involved in this, the COO, CIO group. Uh, we, we do share our best pract practices, uh, and, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, we learn from other departments, and hopefully they learn from us. With uh, uh, Social Security and uh, with you being on the council, aren't you? And uh, that includes all CIOs? Well, the council I refer to is the President's Management Council, which is the deputy the secretary, deputy, deputy, deputy commissioner level. And that's your equivalent for Social Security. Right. Yeah. What I'm wondering about when I hear there is no uh, uh, CIO in one place, uh, Mr. Foreman, do we have uh, any more that uh, are missing CIOs? Departments that are missing CIOs? Yeah. Yes, we do. We, uh, I thought we had um, gotten a full cadre, um, but uh, we seem to run up against the inevitable situation in government where uh, people stay in their jobs for around 18 months. And um, so we're working through getting some new folks. So what, what I would say is that uh, we do seem to get good talent in these jobs. And uh, as uh, people are retiring or leaving for other opportunities, finding good people to, to fill in. And I'll give you an example on that. I think one of the most important ones here is the security liaison in the CIO Council. And that's a, a CIO that's essentially uh, works with the, the different committees. We have three major committees, uh, the Workforce Skills, the Best Practices Committee, and the Architecture Committee, and infuses security focus into those committees. Uh, Ron Miller, who had been the CIO at FEMA, moved over to work on the transition team. Uh, FEMA was able to promote uh, a deputy that he had recruited in a uh, very talented and, and capable person, Rose Parks, to their CIO. Um, but meanwhile, we quickly, because of the importance of this, wanted to make sure we had a, a solid CIO for that liaison. And so we picked Van Hitch, who is the CIO at the Justice Department. Now, uh, Justice is... Um, one of the differences of opinion I would have with, with your scorecard, I think they've made good progress there. Um, but uh, Van also uh, was a recent hire from the private sector. Uh, when he was hired into the government, he came in with, uh, and this was one of the, the early ones, the uh, Attorney General anointing the CIO as having the responsibility that was originally envisioned under the Clinger Cohen Act. So yeah. uh, we're, we're working through the inevitable rotation, and there are some success stories there as well that we're able to gain with that. Now, CFOs, are we short them in some of the agencies and departments? That I'm not prepared. 
prepared to address. Yeah, anybody uh, here been looking at stealing people from one place to the other? <laughs> well, let's get it in the record and without objection, it'll be put in at this point. I'd just like to know the degree to which chief uh, financial officers, to what relation do they have to help in this situation and work with the chief information officer? And uh, yeah, I'd like to hear how that, because part of the problem here is w who's getting what part of the pie uh, to get uh, the uh, cyber situation. We, I, I can answer from the Social yeah. Security standpoint. Uh, we, we uh, I think we find the working relationship extremely important between the CFO, the CIO, and the systems group. And uh, they work very closely. They're all part of the, the senior management team at Social Security. Uh, we work close, closely in a very integrated fashion on the budget process. Uh, we work on the physical security as well as computer security together. And I think uh, that teamwork has really helped and been part of our success is that uh, we have people extremely devoted to, to the agency and to our mission. And you know, partially that is because uh, since almost day one of Social Security, we've been concerned about personal security, personal privacy. That was our first regulation. And so it's really infused in our culture and that includes the CFO, the CIO, the systems group, and, and really the 65,000 people of Social Security. And so that's one of the important ish ways that we've tackled this. Uh, I was heading just for you, the yeah. Inspector General. Hey, well, that's you've me, got um, a council too, <laughs> and so uh, what's happening that uh, IGs, you're doing, for example, on the uh, financial management part of uh, your working, uh, you're the one that uh, can go outside and uh, put the uh, uh, accounting aspects of it. And uh, I'd be curious how much the IGs can help uh, the CIO so they can get the resources they need. I think the, in, the the inspector general concept is r really key to helping both the CIO and the CFO functions fully blossom. And the the, in, the creatures we call inspector generals is a very peculiar uh, reporting relationship. We have by law we are to report to the secretary and the Congress and to keep each uh, currently and fully informed. But inspector generals are part of the agency that they're responsible for auditing. And they see things happening um, much earlier than other outside oversight agencies might be able to. And you're able to affect proactive change. And I think that it's important that you have a collaborative relationship with the CIOs and CFOs in these agencies. And I would say, uh, for example, at uh, the Department of Transportation, the CFO is also the Assistant Secretary for Budget, which means that that CFO has clout. When, that, when the Assistant Secretary for Budget speaks, she's also speaking with her CFO hat. Uh, we've turned the situation around on the financial statements at DOT for almost eight or nine years running. Uh, they got a, a, a disclaimer, and now um, they've greatly improved their financial situation. The situation with the chief information officer is a bit different because the chief information officer doesn't have any line authority over much of anything. And I, I point that out in contradistinction to the, the, the chief financial officer construct. If I can add to that, I, I think that it, it's important to understand the implications there on a couple of fronts. First of all, when we talk about the President's management agenda and the five scorecards, um, th there are a lot of interrelationships. And the one that's important here is between the financial management scorecard and the e-government score. Uh, generally, and we went through this in this last quarter, when there's a material weakness related to security, program, 
um, the agency's gonna get a double zinger. They'll get it on the management scorecard and they'll get it on the e-government scorecard. Um, they're, what the public sees is the scores. What the president sees is the detail behind the scores. And that includes the names of the person who's responsible for that. So they'll see the zinger on the two scores with the CIO or whoever the e-government lead is for that department and the CFO or whoever's the financial management lead for that department. It's important, therefore, I think that we continue to have uh, computer security linked in with being a financial material weakness. Um, the other thing is that, that you alluded to, uh, we did go through this um, uh, almost a year ago, situation where a CFO said, oh, OMB will forget about the security issues, it's not a big deal, um, and that CFO learned that that was a career-threatening th comment. Um, this is extremely important to the White House, and uh, that's, I think that word has gotten around to the other CFOs now. There is a CFO in the executive uh, uh, forces of the uh, executive branch and the executive uh, where uh, OMB is there and uh, a whole group of agencies. Is that CFO still there? Uh, that's a, a good question. Again, I don't know uh, for a fact that, that that person is still in their job. Yeah, well, we put it in uh, the there before the current president, and it was uh, we tried to do it with the previous president, and they said, no, no, we don't want that. And I said, hey, wait a minute. This will be for the next president. Oh, no problem, they said. <laughs> Let him do it. <laughs> Good heavens. Now, I'm just curious because we do need a CFO and a CIO. Now, who's the CIO that uh, helps your colleagues in the executive office of the president? Well, um, our, uh, uh, I I'm not sure that we have the formal, the form, uh, formal anointment of uh, a CIO. Uh, our uh, CIO, who had been your CIO here in the House, uh, was promoted to the, uh, to the Office of Administration. Um, so his deputy moved up as at least the acting uh, CIO. Um, and I think, you, as you know, we've worked uh, fairly closely with the appropriation staff to uh, make sure that the Executive Office of the President is being held to the exact same standard that we're holding all the other agencies to. Uh, that's a commitment. You know, if, you, if you're going to uh, hold other agencies accountable, you have to start by holding yourself accountable. So we've done that. Uh, I will say that, uh, and I don't know our, our uh, results on our security uh, review um, yeah, but I, I will say as a user, primary user, uh, I've had more things stripped from emails by our firewall, uh, which is one of the signs I know. We, we don't experience many, uh, much downtime. And we are ultimately a prime target in the hacker community. Uh, so we have extensively strong firewalls and an exceedingly risk adverse IT security policy that's employed fire firewalls and other uh, tools. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Uh, is there a question on this particular witness? Go ahead. There was one question I, that I wanted to get to. I have to leave in just a second, but uh, the uh, Mr. Mead, uh, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, um, does the Federal, uh, Federal Aviation Administration have a tested contingency plan to ensure that it can continue to operate uh, its air traffic control system if, if hackers were to successfully attack them? That's uh, important to all of us. <laughs> May I uh, give this a two-part answer? First, a decision was made earlier this uh, year uh, based on a report we issued with recommendations that the air traffic control system uh, not be tied in any way to the Internet. Uh, there was a proposal from FAA, I think, uh, had been percolating from 99 to 2000 period, that they would have a system that, in theory, would be insulated from the Internet, but um, we felt it would be vulnerable. Um, the high-level decision was made this year that that will not be the case. Therefore, 
um, the air traffic control system cannot be hacked through um, directly from the internet. And I think that was a very good decision, although it's going to cost some money. It's worth it. Secondly, uh, the air traffic control system, if one part of it were to go down for some reason, other elements of it can pick up for, for, on a temporary period, for a temporary period of time, uh, the operations of the component that went down. We do think, as we reported in our GISPR report, that for the longer term, FAA needs a more robust contingency plan. But for the shorter term, uh, we think they have a good one. In addition, um, as I noted in our testimony, the background checks on people uh, have improved dramatically over the last couple of years. The principal exposure we have on the ATC system is not from uh, private uh, attackers. It is insi insiders or contractors. That's where the attention needs to be focused. But for the short term, I give, pretty good, I'll give you good assurances that we're in, in decent shape. For the longer term, we need to pay more attention, and that's what we duly reported to OMB and the Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, let us uh, just uh, have a couple with the uh, uh, Mr. Meade, the Inspector General. And uh, the Security Act directs Agency Chief Information Officer to develop and maintain an agency-wide information security program. Yet the Department of Transportation has not had a Chief Information Officer since January 2001. Why has this been allowed to continue, and who has taken on the responsibility in lieu of the chief information officer? Why has it happened? They uh, have not been from want of recruiting. They did have a candidate uh, that fell through for uh, one reason or other. They are now uh, vetting other candidates. Uh, but I, I've got to say that I, I think that uh, the importance of the position needs to be recognized more vigorously. Because if you were talking about the FAA administrator, the Assistant Secretary for Budget, uh, Deputy Secretary, uh, those positions would not be allowed to go vacant for such a long period of time. So I think that we'll have a chief information officer. Um, I think it'll take uh, probably two or three more months. But we really need one. Uh, you know, this year, Mr. Chairman, OMB did something I think was quite good. Uh, they bought together the management side of OMB, the budget side at very senior levels, the inspector general, the budget people, the chief information officer. And they went over the range of material weaknesses that needed to be addressed. And missing, of course, was our chief information officer because we didn't have one. Instead, and here's the answer to your second part of your question, we had the acting chief information officer who uh, has taken on that position frequently, given that over the last six years we've had a chief information officer for only 18 months. And you haven't seen a problem. Is that it? Or where? No, I have seen a problem. Yeah. And okay. the, problem, the problem is twofold at DOT. It's, um, one, the, the, the CIO does not have line authority over budgets and does not have input into the performance appraisals of the chief information officers of the various operating administrations. You need to have those two elements. Just getting, we, we did have a chief information officer in the last 18 months of the last administration. And we still had problems. And we had problems largely because uh, the operating administrations do not feel accountable to that CIO. And right now you have De Secretary Mineta and Deputy Secretary Jackson uh, doing the street work 
to uh, get attention paid to information security. And they're doing a good job. They have a lot of other things to do, too. Uh, Mr. Foreman, are there other uh, CIOs that do not have any uh, looking at uh, in terms of the budget? Or is it uh, at the upper level of a deputy secretary? Well, obviously, especially in this area, we want the secretaries and deputy secretaries to foc focus on uh, improving the quality of the cybersecurity posture at the departments. Uh, but uh, I have to agree with, with Mr. Mead. Where we've seen progress, uh, there's been a clear action taken to empower the CIO. We did some of that in the budget process last year. Obviously, our focus on capital planning and enterprise architecture is, is, fo is specifically for that purpose. Uh, but also other secretaries, the Attorney General, um, so where, where there is a secretary or where we working with the secretaries, make it clear that the CIO is fully empowered, um, we see progress. Now, uh, I would say um, transportation is one where there's a less than powerful um, CIO. I think though we, you know, whether it's OMB or if you talk to the secretary, deputy secretary, I'll agree they need a powerful CIO. Um, you run into an interesting uh, situation then trying to recruit someone because you know that first person there is going to be one that's going to take on some very long-standing cultural issues, uh, political issues, both internal and relationship between operating administrations and the Congress. And it does take, uh, I've found a concerted effort in working with this committee, uh, with the appropriations committees, uh, with um, the, the leadership of that department and OMB to make that change occur. It, and that's really tough, absent a burning uh, document or crisis like at the situation at Interior. Well, we'll move to uh, the uh, Carnegie Mellon expert here. And uh, in your testimony, you state that the number of reported incidents continue to rise. Mr. Weed. Uh, Mead uh, stated that the Department of Transportation has reported more than 25,000 incidents in 2002, although all may not have been intrusions. Meanwhile, some agencies, such as the Department of Housing and Urban Development, have reported no incidents. Given your expertise on this subject, how would you explain this disparity? Um, two reasons that I can think of. Um, one of them is uh, that often organizations, both in the government and the, in the private sector, um, shy away from reporting of incidents because they don't want the little black mark that goes next to uh, their name that says there's a possibility of a security problem. We certainly see a lot of that in, in the private sector. Um, concerns over loss of confidence in the, in the organization uh, makes people reluctant to want to report. <coughs> Um, the second reason is that very often, I think, a lot of these incidents go not just unreported but undetected. Um, we know that intrusion detection technology is only moderately effective. <coughs> we know that many organizations don't have active programs in place to monitor their systems and monitor their networks to look for signs of intrusion. And so I think it's a combination of the both. Uh, organizations that don't want to report because they're concerned about embarrassment but also all too often the case that these, these incidents go undetected. You expressed uh, concern about the vulnerabilities associated with the supervisory uh, control and data access systems. Can you give us a specific example of the result if one of these systems, which controls some of the nation's critical infrastructure, were successfully attacked? Um, the example that was in my testimony was a, re a case that was reported from Australia where uh, it was actually a disgruntled employee who uh, decided to affect the operations of a sewage control system and in fact hundreds of thousands of gallons of sludge were, were dumped out into the environment causing, causing the environmental impacts of that. Um, you, can, you can hypothesize certainly other kinds of incidents where very simply things like oil stops flowing, natural gas stops flowing, um, power isn't delivered to certain parts of the country. Hydroelectric dams uh, are suddenly releasing water into 
river valleys where, where the level of water is not expected. Um, so I think this is an area where we have to begin to understand and pay more attention to the fact that the cyber world and the physical world are now tightly connected. And we often think about physical events and cyber events as separate kinds of things. But now that we're living in a situation where we have to pay attention to terrorists, people who want to disrupt our society, I think we have to, all of us, have a better understanding of how the cyber world and the physical world are connected, how physical attacks, how the impact of those attacks can be amplified by cyber attacks. So, for example, if there were to be a physical attack on one of our cities, disrupting the communication systems at the same time would slow um, the response to that kind of an attack. It would slow emergency services. Um, and similarly, we can see how physical attacks can exacerbate cyber attacks as well. And that's an area of work that I think, you know, now that we're beginning to get some of the basics in place, I think we need to look beyond just cyber alone and look at the connection between cyber and physical. Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, address a Mr. key Foreman. point uh, in that. You know, we track data on intrusions, and we see the numbers of thousands of intrusions. And while I'm sure that's important, uh, the issue that has long existed is the internal threat. And the, the, the corollary to that is you have to know what you do once you intrude. You have to know what a piece of data is. Uh, breaking into an Oracle or uh, an IBM DB2 database uh, doesn't get me anywhere if I don't have a copy of that somewhere on my computer and know what that data structure is. Otherwise, all I've done is uh, revealed a string of who knows what. So it, it's not as, I don't believe, as uh, simple as saying the number of intrusions have gone up and therefore there's a real problem here. Uh, you have to have some insight about what you, you're doing in order to say there's a real vulnerability or threat. Any thoughts on that uh, comment? Oh, I think that's certainly certainly uh, true. Um, the The great majority of what we see out there are what I often call recreational hacking attacks. Um, hackers who are out looking for um, things to explore, who are out to prove some kind of a political point, who are not really bent on on doing damage. But I think as we become more reliant on this technology, and as we interconnect more and more of our systems. The, the people who are serious about causing damage or the people who are serious about taking advantage of us for their own personal profit, the criminals and the terrorists, uh, will begin to move more and more in, into this space. And, and I agree with Mark. You certainly can't attack a system and do an awful lot of damage unless you know some things about it. But, but we do know that our systems are being surveilled. We know that they're constantly being probed. We know that networks are being mapped. We know that there are people out there who are working very hard to understand how our systems are configured and how they're put together. And so um, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of the thing we have to pay attention to is the insider threat, but an awful lot of outsiders are working hard to become as knowledgeable as the insiders, and we can expect to see those kinds of attacks in the future. Well, along that line, that uh, someone with your extensive knowledge of federal operations, what are the most important actions federal agencies must take to improve their computer security? Um, I, I'm very happy to see GISRA and the effects that it's beginning to have. I think the steps that are outlined there are exactly the right ones for agencies to go through right now. Uh, but as Mark said, Mr. Foreman, earlier in his testimony, as we're now beginning to get some of these high-level things in place, uh, it's time to get down into the details, the nuts and the bolts. And that's why I often speak about the need for more trained professionals, uh, more knowledge about security, security issues, uh, because this risk management action, as, as we begin to get the senior level attention, as we begin to get security plans in place, as we begin to go through an annual assessment process, now it's time to implement uh, those corrections that are needed. And that requires knowledgeable people. And so I think the next step is for agencies to have a real understanding of exactly why these vulnerabilities are serious and then to put effect the right kind of implementations uh, and monitor those implementations for effectiveness over time. Mr. Dacey, uh, based on your analyses of the last two years of agency reports required by the Government Information Security Reform Act, do you believe that the federal government is making progress in its efforts to security government 
computer systems? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I do believe they're making progress. There are many actions underway, uh, both, as I said, at a government-wide level and agency level. And I would distinguish some of those actions. I think some of them think some of the more challenging, but longer-lasting actions will take some time to fully implement. We've talked about some of those here this morning. Putting in an effective security management program, I think, is key because oftentimes in doing our audits, we find that maybe the agency, in fact, fixed some of the specific weaknesses on the specific systems we audited, which is only a small portion of the agency's systems. And yet we find the same types of incidents and problems occurring in other systems within the agency. And in fact, have seen on several occasions the same weaknesses recur as new operating systems are installed and the same changes aren't made to those new operating systems that were fixed on the old ones. So I do think uh, security management is key. I think we're seeing some fundamental changes taking place. We, we talked uh, earlier today, um, Honorable Mr. Lockhart had talked about SSA and their efforts to monitor their systems and put together a program to really highlight to executive management uh, what's going on and, and really to probe their own systems and understand. And we're seeing some efforts in that uh, arena as well. We're seeing uh, responsibilities. VA recently uh, moved the responsibilities for security and all the budget decisions to the CIO, similar to what we talked about. And I know there are a number of agencies, although I don't know today that that's still an issue, but we've seen where that's happening. It's starting to make fundamental changes to, uh, to the core, because what we really need is a, is, a, is a structure of management that can address these problems. We talk about vulnerabilities that are showing up the magnitude of about a 12 or 13 a day on average, and I'm sure that's increasing. Mr. Pethia might update us on that, but, but it really calls for a, a, a fundamental management structure, and it is a management challenge rather than a technical one. I, I do agree we need to uh, address some of the technical issues. I think uh, with the bill that Congress recently passed to provide some funding for research and development and education are two key areas that will help uh, address some of those problems. Uh, but I do think those are are the issues, uh, uh, but I do think they're improvements. I think there need to be more, though, uh, and again, getting back to the other discussion, some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, we, we know, uh, you know, on one hand, there's a big risk because there's a lot of hacker tools and a lot of known vulnerabilities that exist. On the other hand, we need to take that information and take it back to our own systems and say, well, we know what kind of things that the hackers might attack. We need to make sure our systems are prepared to address those areas. So, so there is a lot of progress, but, but we also got to keep in mind that the risk, I think, is dramatically increasing. We're not dealing in a static risk environment. I think it's increasing, and I think it will be a continuing challenge to, to make sure that those improvements keep pace, or I factually need to outpace the increase in the risk to make progress, real progress. What uh, lessons can be learned from those agencies that are successfully improving their computer security? I, I think uh, Mr. Lockhart addressed some of those issues in terms of uh, security management. We uh, issued a guide in 1998 which really laid out a lot of the key issues and Gizro was fundamentally based on some of the same principles and your grades uh, which you put up today are also based upon security management concepts and that is uh, putting in place a uh, key function responsible for computer security at a level in the agency that has senior management's attention. That's a key aspect. Mm -hmm. Making sure you've got risk assessments, understanding what those risks are. I know there's some government-wide efforts now through NIST to develop standardized guidance for certification and accreditation. They're now in draft and really lay out three risk levels and they intend to go further and identify uh, minimum controls for those risk levels as well as techniques that can be used to assess them. So we really have uh, a structure that's starting to take place to assess the risks. And I think those agencies that have gone ahead and done that, that are far advanced in the certification and accreditation process, have been able to demonstrate a better knowledge of their systems and, in fact, inventory their systems, which is something that's in the Federal Information Security Management Act, a fundamental process to make sure agencies have all their systems identified so they can begin that risk assessment process. And agencies like SSA, I think, have done a reasonable job of trying to identify the systems and, and manage them, so that's important. Uh, the second area is, is making sure you have the commensurate controls. I think with uh, some of the NIST efforts and uh, that, that may go to, uh, to help, I think that's a promising action that could help because right now each agency is deciding on their own on what controls they need to implement. And, and there isn't a constancy. And if we have that, as we talked about in a testimony, I think in July, there can be some uh, constancy in training uh, as well as uh, tools developed to help people do what they need to do. Third area is really uh, awareness. I, 
I think a lot of agencies are now putting together programs to make sure that the employees are aware. Uh, computer security is fine, but if someone can call up somebody in the agency and they're willingly give up their password or use passwords that aren't very secure, uh, that really endangers the whole system, not only that system, but anything it's connected to in a trusted environment. So I think that's another area where we've seen progress. And, and the last uh, area is really in the monitoring and we're starting to see some agencies such as Social Security go outside to really uh, have someone come in and help them test their systems to see if they're secure. I think that's a key component that's been long missing, but we're starting to see a lot of activity in that regard. Uh, also as part of the certification and accreditation process, NIST is working on developing standards for accrediting entities that would do that. I think one of the important elements if we're going to proceed in this effort, and I think it's important, is to ensure some consistency in the types of testing and contr of controls that are carried out. Because right now, there's a, there's a wide variation in the, in the quality and extent uh, of the procedures that may be used by private sector. And I think bringing those to some consistency will be important. So I think those are all aspects that where agencies have done those kind of things and, and, and put responsibility in the CIO position, we're starting to see uh, some fundamental changes. But again, those will take some time to, to come to fruition. And, and for uh, all those significant weaknesses we talked about to be identified. Um, lastly, uh, those significant weaknesses, as I said, my testimony will likely increase because I think we're still finding more of them. And, and as those get uh, identified, hopefully those will get addressed as well and we'll get the numbers down. In the help GAO and you have given us, uh, to what degree are the agencies having very realist adequate contingency plans to recover their critical operations without a significant loss in their ability to conduct their mission? Uh, based upon our review and the chart, we identified uh, 20 agencies that had a one or more significant weaknesses in contingency planning. And I think that's particularly uh, important because we were looking at reports issued since uh, September of, or after September of last year. And so uh, that is a, a critical area, and I know a lot of agencies have been trying to address that, but again, get back to fundamental issues. Do you know your systems, uh, what they are? In some cases, we still struggle with that. When we do our audits and go in and ask for inventories and structures of networks, we oftentimes don't get up-to-date pictures of what the agency has, and they need that. Uh, secondly, we've seen where there are plans, they may not be complete, uh, and, and assets properly prioritized. And, uh, Probably one of the most important elements missing in many is, is really a comprehensive testing. Again, some agencies are doing that. But unless you comprehensively test this uh, process, and, and I mean frequently, I don't know, there's no def definite frequency, but with some degree of frequency, uh, you don't know if it's going to work if, in case you have to employ it. I know there were a lot of lessons learned based upon the effects of 9-11 uh, on the private sector, which we've had in prior testimonies before this committee. I think those are important lessons. Some of the more successful entities in the private sector had fairly extensive disaster recovery programs as well as regular drills. Uh, I do remember one of them, in fact, having practiced what happens if our senior management who makes the key decisions isn't available to talk to. And, and in fact, they practiced that and that's what happened 9-9-11. They were busy evacuating lower Manhattan. The people who don't make day-to-day -day decisions had to make them and they had prepared to do that by private prior exercises. So I think there's a lot of uh, challenges still in that area in a post-9-11 uh, situation, particularly, as Mr. Pethy pointed out, uh, the increasing threats for intentional damage that might occur. Are there any things we have not brought up that would be useful in terms of getting a better t type of a score in the last year or two more years, and there wouldn't be a lot of Fs all over that place? Let's see how many can be at Social Security, and uh, that would uh, help. I, like, I, I, would, I would like to see you. Or I, like, I, I would like to see some tighter milestones. Having gone through the Y2K experience at transportation, where we have a lot of these operational systems like air traffic control, search and rescue, I think there is a very important value in having a date certain that everybody's marching towards. And the beauty of Y2K, uh, when it may be in hindsight I could use that word, but was that it was an unwaivable 
date. It was certain to occur. And the agency heads from, and all the staffs knew that they were marching to get that done. And a, a serious computer security incident would get our attention, but it might come too late. I would like to echo Mr. Mead's comments. I think one of the key areas that we have indicated in some of our prior reports and testimonies, both for federal information security and critical infrastructure protection, is a need to establish uh, deadlines and goals. I know one of the efforts that OMB has put forward as a result of last year's GISRA report was requiring all major agencies to undergo a project matrix review which would identify significant uh, assets of the agency and go about to identify interdependencies and come out with a plan to remedy those, uh, any risks that they identified. Uh, one of the challenges there, though, is it's now taken uh, a fair amount of time to get through that, and many agencies have finished the first step. I know Social Security has, uh, I believe, already done that and is moving on in the second step. But I think uh, one of the challenges is when, when does the government expect these actions to be, some of these key actions to be completed, and I think that's uh, an important part of setting, again, a, uh, a, a deadline helps to, to solidify what resources you need to get to that deadline. I think that could be beneficial. I want to thank our witnesses today and uh, the Vice Chairman, uh, Mr. Lewis, and I'm uh, heartened by the administration's attention to this urgent problem. Uh, However, I am confident that the sustained pressure by the Office of Management and Budget, the General Accounting Office, and the Committee on Government Reform in the Congress, federal agencies will continue to make strides to protect these vital systems. We must solve this problem, and we must solve it quickly. The American people desire to know that the information they share with the federal government is protected. They must also be assured that the government services they rely on will not be interrupted. I now want to thank the uh, subcommittee staff that uh, has worked on this with a number of you. Uh, Bonnie Heald, the staff director, Put your hand up. Don't be shy around this place. Uh, Henry Ray, senior counsel. He's down working. Uh, he was uh, very uh, uh, working in terms of three bills we had the last night of this Congress, and uh, they're about to go signed by the president. Uh, counsel uh, Dan Daly. Uh, Dan Costello, Professor Staff, uh, the uh, Majority Clerk, uh, Chris uh, Barkley, and uh, Staff Assistant uh, Ursula uh, Wajakowski, and then the detailed E from the General Accounting Office has spent a lot of time on this. She is working here with my left hand and uh, your right. And uh, we are delighted that the General Accounting Office and uh, Elizabeth Johnston uh, has done a wonderful job. And I hope we can keep her longer, although I don't know GAO might want her back or at least put a chain on her. So uh, she's done a great job. And on the minority staff, we have Michelle Lash, the counsel, and uh, Jean Gosa, the minority clerk. And they've done a wonderful job every hearing I've known. And then I thank the court reporters, Christina Smith and Desiree Jura. Thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned.
coming up, two discussions from last week's Military Reporters and Editors Conference. The first one's on a possible U.S.-led war with Iraq, followed by a 